department is called the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. We changed our name a few years ago. And I'll try to be very broad. I'm a chemist. I'm an organic chemist. I understand. <laughs> I understand. So, don't worry. So, uh, over you, I'm going to talk to you about, you know, the kind of undergrad students that we're seeing now. Uh, how to use real life scenarios and connecting with science can make it interesting for students and how using technology in a good way can help you do something with science. So this is the um, updated mission statement at Hampshire University and I, have, I guess to say this is our 150th year. I'm sure you've seen all the billboards and everything else. So this is our updated Hampshire University. is a comprehensive institution of higher education dedicated to the promotion of learning, building of character, and preparation of promising students for positions of leadership and service. Its curricular emphasis is scientific and professional with a strong liberal arts undergirding. It carried out its mission in the university requires that everything is done by you know, the highest quality. This is the first paragraph. <laughs> I think the rest of it. But what I want to kind of point out that we actually got scientific into the mission statement. And you'll see a lot of universities now, they're, they're trying to get more, you know, STEM, scientific, into what they're doing. So these are the five top majors at Hampton. Number one is biology. Everybody wants to know this group. Everybody. Uh, number three is pre-pharmacy. So we have at Hampton, um, most places you get a four-year degree, and then you go somewhere else a professional to get your pharmacy degree. We have it condensed, so you do two years undergrad, and then you apply, you go directly to a PharmD. So it's, great. so it's very intense. Not everybody accomplishes it, but a lot of people want to be pharmacists. <coughs> uh, business is very popular, and journalism. So science is really high up on you know, students' interest coming in. So I still college majors, uh, they need to be good problem solvers, and that's something that students don't understand coming right in. That, you know, when somebody's hiring you, they're not just hiring you for what you know is your ability to figure out something you don't know. So you need to be good problem solvers. You need to be strong in mathematics. And I was telling this to the table there. I teach general and organic chemistry. The highest level of math at that level is algebra. You know, you, you, you're not hitting on the PCAM math, which is differential equations. They're struggling with the algebra, which is, you know, middle school, high school, you know, reading comprehension. They don't read. <laughs> you know, they don't. They skim, they pick out. Um, also, build knowledge base. Something you learn in general chemistry, I'm not saying you remember everything, but you're supposed to retain when you go to organic and higher level. And you know, they understand the concept of prerequisite courses. That you know, this is why you take it in order. You cannot jump and take biochemistry before you have passed organic, for instance. Um, laboratory experience. Um, uh, some students come in, have never even touched a beaker or touched a burette. Some students had done titrations, know exactly what's going on. So you had this really wide breadth that you have to kind of bring together. Um, I was telling my table that I actually pulled my class and said, you know, how many of you have had advanced chemistry? How many of you had chemistry? I've had a couple, few hands show up that had no chemistry. And it was sitting in, I, sitting in the class. So you have that really wide breadth. Um, and so laboratory is, you know, very essential. And I know that, you know, on high school, middle school level, because of your resources, you might be able to do demonstrations. And it's probably a very good demonstration. They don't remember it. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure, you know, once in a while, they'll tell me the truth. Yeah, my teacher did do that. OK. Well, the rest of them say, nah, I don't remember that. Um, also, you should have scientific curiosity. You know, you should be curious about what's going on. You should be wondering, you know, what, how is this working? How is this happening? Um, advanced science courses will be lovely. Like I said, we have a second that do AP chemistry, AP biology. I, again, I had very few who did have any chemistry. Don't know how that happened. And also, keeping a laboratory notebook 
that, you know, it's, you know, what, why do we do it? It's a professional document. You know, if years from now, somebody should be able to bring your notebook out and repeat what you did. It can be in a law case. You know, I try to bring it to them like that. Because they're all like, you know, why do we have to do this? Why do we have to sign it? This and that. So all of these are very important for STEM majors. <coughs> Millennial students. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I said a couple of years ago, I guess we were so concerned in Hampton. We had an all-day event talking about literacy. This day brought somebody from the outside, you know, to school us on what was coming, you know. So short attention, I'm part of the preacher to choir. Short attention span, I mean like they could forget what they're saying to me in the middle of the sentence. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. Tether to their technology. You know, no phones in the lab. I don't care unless somebody dies. You know, your mother or father should not be calling you while you're in lab. So, or having or playing music, and you know, they're not even sneaky with like I, I should not hear your music. I should not hear it. Uh, short on patience if something doesn't work right away. You know, this is what experimentation is about. You know, so we're working with all that. Uh, they do not read. I said that before. Or take notes. They take pictures. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, and they're overstimulated because they think they can multitask. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I have to explain to them, you're not at that level yet. Right. You know, I, I was on my way out of grad school before I could effectively multitask, especially not an undergrad. Um, but for one thing with them to make it meaningful, they need to connect the course material to current culture. That's something that grabs their interest. If it interests them, then they're zoned in. They will stick with it. But they don't understand why. They always want to know why. You know, why are we doing this? Why is this this way? And they're, they're, they're really ready to make personal connections with you. They will glam on to you. And <laughs> they will glam on to you. And they want to make that connection. And, you know, they feel kind of like maybe not, if they feel like they're not making a connection with you, then that really affects them. So. To engage students in science, we want to do more like hands-on participation. Also, kind of relate to something going on in real life. Also, utilize some technology, some um, YouTube videos. Sometimes have them make their own YouTube videos, and also websites and science fair projects. You know, um, we've had undergrads go and help students and middle school students get their science fair projects together. And it, I'm talking to students, and some students have told me they haven't done a science fair project since middle school, or you know, since elementary school, where I did a science fair project all the way up to eleventh grade. So that is something that definitely needs to be taken care of. So if you are passionate or enthusiastic, it does translate. The students do feel it that you know you are enthusiastic about the subject. You know, now I do tell my students, I am not a physical chemist, thermodynamics, first law. We want to get through it together. You know, <laughs> I, I will teach the material. Uh, but you need to also engage the students' individual interests. You know, some students are really interested in cancer. Some are really interested in materials. You know, and it might be something that deals with their family. Um, expanding their horizons. They don't know what they like until they try you know, so try something new. I, I don't care if you've never done it before. Just go ahead and try it and then let me know. And also something impacts on society. They're very conscious about what's going on in society environmentally. And also into the slurry topics, not just chemistry, chemistry and biology, chemistry and math. You know, we can branch chemistry and computers. You know, when you bring other things in, that really sparks their interest. Like, oh, okay, it's not just this dry thing that's in this textbook that I don't open. That if I open, it's like dust moths floating around. So for uh, me, I try to bring research I've done into the classroom. So one of my in research interests is Dragon Maven, and it actually is a lipopeptide that has anti-malaria um, activity. So a lot of the malaria drugs that are out there, they're not, they're not useful anymore because the mosquitoes have evolved, basically. So I got undergrad students. I even had some high school students who worked with me, work on that project. Also, iron nanoparticles from green tea leaves. So you know, you actually take some green tea bags, 
brew it, and then make the iron nanoparticles from that. So, and that actually was um, used to do oil recovery. So, like when we're thinking about like the oil spill in the Gulf, you know, how can you effectively get it? Because the nanoparticles are magnetic. So, if it surrounds the oil, then you can pull it out. So that's what the idea behind it. Molecular modeling using iPad apps. So actually do, do some labs using iPads. And so some things that you would normally do, um, like, like try to get like bond angles or bond distance or even heat of formation, that kind of thing. Doing on iPads, they think it's cool. We're on iPad and they just want to go with it. And then actually a CSI style lab experiment. So this is something that I meant is a mass spec lab. And you know, it's like an unknown compound, and we had to make it with a series of dilution volumetric flasks. And then we said, when you come up with your compound, if you say it's like a hydrocarbon or like a, a halide hydrocarbon, then it's from a petroleum refinery. If it's a ketone ether, then it's from a pharmaceutical place. So, like, not only when you write your report, you got to say, where did the criminal come from? So, kind of bringing all that together. And then also exploring how students learn science, especially organic chemistry, you have to be able to think in three dimensions. And it's hard. <laughs> it's very hard, I know. And so trying to see, you know, what is it that, that connection that allows them to, you know, then get the aha moment. So, so I'm looking at that as well. So these are actually some experiments that we did with um, middle school students and high school students. Uh, we had a black family conference we have every year. And this year, we actually invited students from the local schools to come to campus. And we actually had them make gray slime, which is like Elmer's glue with borax, and some blood well, rinse because they went wild for it. <laughs> and you know, talk, it's polymers. Uh, paper chromatography, this is actually with M&Ms. So that you just take the M&Ms, and you sit it in water, and then you dip it on the paper, and then you let it go up, and you see the different colors. So that's a you know fun way to introduce chromatography, um, extracting DNA from wheat germ, and you have to go to the whole food store because we've done this. The other one, the toasted, gets you no DNA at all. <laughs> <laughs> you get the good wheat germ, and you can actually see the, uh, the DNA. You can actually uh, roll it on your toothpick. And when I buy a can, she actually had um, had them do a UV um, melting curve on it. So like actually put it in there and heat it up and see see the curve on it for the students. A uh, crush can, that's an um, ideal gas law, so under pressure, um, have a can. And then ozone layer, so um, one of my girlfriends, her son in middle school, he did this project. He wanted to see uh, the difference in ozone, and he did here in Virginia, he did up in Maryland, so he set up his little strips and had the iodide saying, and so he actually quantitated, you know, who had the better air. <laughs> You know, and he actually went by because we were near Langley, so he actually did that to see that, you know, because we're near Langley Air Force Base, that is a difference. So, so this is a, a website um, that we, it's a free website called Chem Magic, and you can actually go there and do modeling, and you actually click on this called the Molecular Model Kit. And you can go to the screen and you can actually just type in the name if it's in the database. So in this example, we have I've got aspirin typed in. And it pops up the 3D model. And you can turn it around, you can flip it, you can you know, see how the busy ring is flat. And those uh, who are I'm not trying to do the chemistry days, uh, the white is hydrogen, the gray is carbon. <coughs> So, I mean, the gray is carbon, the red is oxygen. And then another way you can do this, you can actually draw your molecule. So if it's not something in the database, you can draw it yourself and you can load it. So here's the molecule and then you can actually optimize it. So this is optimization of the molecule here. And you can do lots of things. You can do dipole moment. You can do bond angles. You can do bond length. So this is a bond angle I did, and so they can see that's 120.9 degrees. So this is something they can just play around with, you know, and, you know, you could, you'd be amazed, you know, I gave this to, like, a freshman to play around with, and she, she just all into it, and she was like, you know, she was like, oh, yes, and she drew her peptide, and I was like, okay, that looks good. I said, you left off the hydrogen there, so 
she's going back to it, but it's something that's really interactive and it helps them to see things. Uh, so free websites are really good, you know, for, you know, if you don't have the budget for it. Um, a colleague of mine brought me on this one for models. If you cannot afford models, gum drops and toothpicks work. You know, something fun in the head. Also, you might have to do, you know, large lab groups to get more people your hands on. And you can incorporate research into your class so you can actually have them do a little small project like the iron nanoparticle thing. And that's an actual research project. Also, real life, real life events. So I was talking about reading. Um, we've actually given students writing assignments based on things that happen in the news. So last year, we had them um, investigate the Flint water crisis. So we asked them to write about the chemistry involved with it and what happened with it. Don't just say they had bad water, but you know what actually happened. Also, um, if you remember when they were in Rio the Olympics, <laughs> one of the pools was green. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we actually had to write a paper on that. Why was the pool green? So they actually had to look up the science behind that. And then this year we had them doing the Arkema, Texas chemical plant fire. It amazed how people do not realize what's going on. I said, did you not realize this was catching fire in Houston, Texas? <laughs> so, you know, the peroxides, they were catching fire. Why were they catching fire? So not just doing labs, but actually had them doing writing assignments where, you know, have them read the actual chemistry and show what's going on. So um, there are lots of summer programs. Um, all the university has summer programs. Uh, these are some that we've had at Canton. Uh, the first one, Enroll Summer Internship, this is actually one I did. I'm originally from Indiana. And when I graduated from high school, I did a summer internship at Soft Sheen Products, making shampoo. I love that summer. I was going to make shampoo, <laughs> conditions, and lotions. And I was working with a cosmetic chemist. I didn't even know there was such a thing. So that was so everybody else was doing business type, but because I said I had an interest in chemistry, they actually found me something with soft chain products. Uh, we had a program called Young Doctors, so like middle school students who are interested in, you know, who they think they want to go to bed school. Uh, manual HU scholars, these are actually students in ninth, tenth grade. And they come in summer, and I had a summer student doing this. She's a second year at Old Dominion right now. And actually do a project in that time we and also teach them how to do a notebook, how to conduct science, how to talk about it. Um, Prim, this is like an a NSF program, also materials, so students doing research in the summer. Same thing with Ellis Sam. Ellis Sam, the person who does is more biology oriented, so they do a lot of biology projects. Uh, we have something called business and engineering, where they actually have the engineering department and the business department together run a summer program. So, like, you have business students learning about engineering concepts. So, I think they're doing more like structural big bridges, that kind of thing, and also the economics of it. And we also have the HU Summer National Travel Institute. So, at um, at Hampton. We had a 6 to 4 or a 7 to 3 female to male ratio. Okay. A lot of college campuses are majority uh, female to male, but we are really lopsided. You know, like in my class, like in one of my lectures of 53, I might have five male students. Yeah, and it, that's the, it's completely flipped for what it is in middle and high school. So it is a real shocker. I don't know what's going on, but I mean, so because of that, you know, you would think the girls would be in power, but they're not used to that environment. And so mentorship is really key with them because when you get higher up in entry, it's not like that. It's totally different. So you have society prejudice with that because you know, a lot of young ladies are not pushed into going into science where the young men are. And so you have professional organizations that have programs to help them adjust. Uh, but, yeah, seriously, like, that, that one right there, you know, I think one, there's a lot of graduations, like, all we graduate is female students in my department. You know, like, if, if you get one male, my chair gets happy. So, and also, it, it's a big emotional adjustment, if you, if you can imagine, you know, say seven to three. I mean, that, that's, that, that, that's a lot of adjustment for them, so. And by meeting a female faculty member, they feel more comfortable talking to 
me or the male professor send them to me because they do not want to go down that road. <clears throat> and uh, well, so I just brought that up to say that um, you know the students that you see just prepare. You know, Hampton is my side, but you look at ODU too. It's more female than male. They're not as bad as us, but it, it's still that way too. So. You know, they might think that it will be the all male. Even engineering is getting a little lopsided. Engineering has been known for all male. I think right now, Hampton, they're like even. But like everybody on special biology is like majority female. <laughs> so um, there are lots of apps that you can use. Um, and this is where the ACS, the American Chemical Society. So these are apps that you use like on your iPads. Um, also, Kim works to say and share literature articles, CNN, so the chemistry and engineering news, it's amazing. So whatever your area is, there are apps that you can get. Some of them are free, where you can download things. And um, ACS Central Science Magazine. So uh, you can get ideas from that and post it to your students so they'll know about it. Um, some general chemistry apps. Um, periodic table, you get information and videos. Um, this one called Bayless, which is cost around a dollar. Um, you can also practice with Lewis structures, um, molarity, um, the dilution calculator, like I said, math is the, is the albatross. <laughs> um, the ideal gas law, and this actually has a simulation. And then we actually have, they have there's like chemistry virtual labs. So it's like simulated labs that you can do on your iPad. And so this is just a list of all of them that you can do that one of my colleagues, he's very into this. So he went and went through and did all of these. So you can find lots of things that you can do, especially the iPad, you can you know, hook it up and project it so students can see, or they have their own device, they can, they can do it themselves. And then Odyssey Wave Function, this is a level uh, modeling one, and it can let you do all of these here. So, again, I'm not trying to get too big a um, So this one actually is a titration one, and you can actually titrate a model of dichloric acid, and you can do volume versus pH. You can actually also use your smartphone and download the app to act as a co-barometer. So this is the, um, the various um, valves set up, and you can actually take a picture of it, and it can actually tell you what the concentration is. So you can actually, you can, and they can actually do it themselves. So I think I have a, yes, yeah, like a cell phone. So this one is actually the cranberry juice. And this is the article here where uh, this person introduced the color analysis with camera phones and digital cameras, and activity for high school general, or general <coughs> So you actually set the test tubes with the different concentrations, and you can actually take a picture of it. And then this is the graph. You can actually, this is the actual data graph from that picture. That you can see that as the percent um, cranberry juice concentration increases, the adsorbance increases as well. And then this is the one from the, the RGB, the other analysis that I showed you. So you can actually, so my colleague, he actually did this because we were in tower spectrometers and we were trying to see where's our spectrometers, how accurate it was just by taking your phone. <coughs> and it was pretty accurate. And the students are really into it because you know you're using a smartphone to do this. So in summary, uh, uh, make science interesting because you know, well we all think it's interesting. But to make it interesting for the students so they are more engaged and they're more likely to stay in it. And you use several methods to engage them. You know, it doesn't have to be hands-on, like I was saying, the real-life scenario thing. And actually, especially like with the, with the uh, plant that was growing up in Houston, Texas, a lot of people didn't know that, and they really became interested when they heard about it. And what was going on? Can you not just think it's outrageous you're storing that many chemicals? And then the refrigerator dies, and then <laughs> your backup dies, and then you can't put the fire out. So. And they use common technology in exploring ways, so like the smartphones, that's something a lot of them have, you know, actually using something to get something interesting out of it. 
Okay, that's it.